Sophia's sixth letter. Dear Yaristan, I couldn't wait to write. I haven't heard from you since I last wrote you because I haven't been home for a week, not even to pick up my mail. I've spent the past week in the commune inside the occupied university, and I love it here. I've been dying to find time to tell you about it and also to finish my previous letter. It got so long that I skipped half of what I wanted to say and didn't deal with any of the questions you'd asked me. I'll tell you about the commune first. Everything I've ever wanted seems to be happening all around me. Thanks to Tina, I got into the midst of it all just as it began. I pinch myself several times a day just to make sure I'm not dreaming. And I'm still not completely sure. What's happening here at this moment is exactly what I longed for, but I never really believed it could happen here. I was intensely happy for you, yet also green with envy, when you described what was happening around you, inside the factories, in the schools, on the streets, and in your own house, wherever you looked. And now it's all taking place here. Employed and unemployed workers, beggars and prostitutes, street kids, are all suddenly bursting with life. They seem to be animated by a single purpose. I've always wondered how I'd have felt during the day Louisa loved to describe. Do you realize it's already 32 years since that day? The day when everyone ran into the street, some with rifles and pistols, but most with kitchen knives and rolling pins, and confronted the entire National Army. Now I know how it must have felt. The Army hasn't come out. Even the police have been suspiciously still. But the feeling I have is that if and when they do move, everyone is going to be in the street, on roofs, at windows, everywhere. At least in this neighborhood. I never knew so many friendly people existed here. Crowds gather at every corner. Complete strangers talk to each other as if they've been lifelong friends. All are intensely interested in every leaflet that's given out. Everyone studies every inscription or poster on a wall. The only time I've experienced anything like this was during that week I spent with you 20 years ago. The steel town in which you worked must have had a similar atmosphere during the time of the Magarna uprising. Today I understand your critique of the activities in which we took part 20 years ago. And I'm convinced that what's ha taking place around me isn't subject to that critique, even in little ways. First of all, there aren't any generally accepted leaders or even influential militants. The leaders that do exist are monarchs of tiny sects. And during the past week, the sects I've come in contact with have been losing adherence instead of gaining them. Secondly, there aren't any official slogans, any correct lines, or even any strategies. It all started when students occupied a university building simply because they'd had enough of a lifeless present and a prospectless future, and not because they had a blueprint of things to come. They didn't even announce a list of demands. They simply sat in and started to talk. Then other students occupied another building. Soon the whole university was occupied. That was when I arrived. I'm not saying the politicians and representatives have all disappeared. They're actually all over. They're constantly waving lists of what we all want and presenting themselves as we students, or even as we proletarians. But at least for the past week, no one's paid any attention to them. They've served mainly as subject matter for cartoons. A week ago, a factory was occupied by its workers. No authority ordered the occupation, neither a political party, nor a union, nor a sect. Since then, other factories have been occupied. All the dams seem to be overflowing all at once. Workers from non-striking factories have been meeting with workers from the occupied factories. I know this is no puppet show, Yaristan. No one is taking any orders. Thousands of people are suddenly speaking and acting on their own. On their own and for themselves. No one is speaking or acting for others. I'm convinced that what's happening around me is what you and I used to call the revolution. I'm writing this letter from the council office and I'm having a hard time concentrating on what I'm telling you. The office is a former classroom. The walls and blackboards have been turned into a vast bulletin board with thousands of messages, announcements, as well as poems and cartoons. The desks and seats contain stacks of newly printed literature. The office serves as a meeting place and mainly as a place where people can find the latest information on the occupied workplaces. My function is to help people find what they're looking for, whether it's a place, a pamphlet, a leaflet, or a person. I think I'm beginning to understand what you tried so hard to tell me about the role of the journalist. Every person who comes into this room has an altogether different account of what's happening. Each person has different stories to tell, and it's precisely this that makes every encounter so stimulating. What you call direct communication is taking place all around me. And I know that a newspaper, no matter how revolutionary, no matter how complete, would destroy that communication. It would replace everyone's account with a single account, the official account. It would replace everyone's lived experience with an experience that hadn't been lived by anyone. Worst of all, people would read about each other instead of talking to each other. And as you pointed out, they wouldn't find each other in any of the articles, no matter how hard they looked. But there's no such newspaper. 
The capitalist press can't even imagine what's happening, and no one pays any attention to it. And whatever journalists there are here are being forced, like the politicians, to speak only for themselves or not at all. The room I'm in is full of literature, but none of it is journalism. Most of it consists of announcements or factual summaries. The rest consists of poetry, comics, satires, sketches. The writings, like the discussions, are attempts by people to communicate with each other directly. What I'm experiencing is something you call communication among likes. Communication by all about themselves, their lives and their possibilities. The communication at the basis of common projects. Besides trying to answer the various questions people come in to ask, I've also corrected and typed some of the frequent announcements and information bulletins. After what I told you in my last letter, you won't believe who I work with on these bulletins and leaflets. Not the academic revolutionaries Damon, Minnie, he or the others. I haven't seen any of them since I've been here. Tina pops in several times a day, always in the midst of a group of workers or students or both, always incredibly busy with the artwork or layout of a leaflet, pamphlet or poster. The printing is done in Ted's print shop. Tina herself does most of the actual printing, although she encourages people to do their own printing. And you won't believe who else is here. The entire garage crew except Vic and Seth, and except Jose, who was killed three years ago. Yes, Sabina is here as well as Tissy. They're together at Enormous Research Center. The workers there are about to occupy the center and open it up to the whole population. It all sounds nebulous, but enormously exciting. Ted and Sabina got Tissy released from a prison hospital. I've been so busy that I haven't seen Tissy yet. In my previous letter, I insisted that my world, as well as yours, was the world of Hugh, Damon, Minnie, and yes, the world of Louisa. She's not here either. I told you that I left the garage in order to return to the world that was so familiar to me, the world which identified with projects I had once shared with you. Isn't it ironic? Now that I'm engaged in precisely those projects, I'm with the very people I'd left in order to engage in them. Does this mean you are right when you said my descent into Sabina's world was a descent into yours? I don't think so. I rather think all the people I knew have changed in ways that couldn't have been predicted. In several of your letters, you argued that such enormous changes were impossible. You seem convinced that once Vera Nice, to take this one example, got on the bureaucratic train, there was no way for her to ever get off. But what's happening here right now disproves that type of fatalism, if nothing else does. Who would ever imagine Sabina or Ted in any way connected with a student commune, or Tissy in a research center? I don't see where your fatalism comes from. You've told me that during your second prison term you became disillusioned with Louisa's frequently obsessive optimism. I don't blame you for that. But don't you see that your fatalism flatly contradicts the very possibility of events like those that took place in Magarna? like those you've been experiencing during the past two months, like those I'm experiencing now? If people were all locked into trains headed towards predictable destinations, who would ever give rise to those unpredictable and unforeseen events we call revolutions? I don't think I was wrong about the people I knew in the garage ten years ago. I think there are different people now. I think they've all changed in completely unpredictable ways. I've seen such changes before. Jose, for example, became totally transformed two or three years after I left the garage. It could happen to Vera, too, as well as Adrian and Mark. One or all of them may yet respond to the atmosphere that first stimulated Yara, then you, then Yasna. You may yet find yourself storming the prison walls alongside your former comrades. In case that happens, be sure you tell me what you did with your fatalism. No, I don't think I was wrong about the nature of the activity in the garage and the bar. When Hugh described it, he merely gave words to my innermost thoughts. That wasn't the project I had sought all my life. It was a capitalist operation existing on the fringes of society and exploiting those least able to defend themselves. I had to leave the garage in order to live my own life, in order to launch my own project. The funny thing is that when I finally did find a project that had something in common with the one I had shared with you, it was with Jose, of all people, a totally transformed Jose. But I'm rambling. A meeting is taking place and I'm trying to listen and write at the same time. Two postal workers are talking excitedly to a group of workers from an occupied factory. I'm trying not to be guilty of Luisa's uncritical optimism, but Yaristan, if postal workers can be affected by the spirit of the occupations, everyone can. Do I dare imagine where all this could lead? How I wish you were here. It's relatively quiet here again. Yes, I wish you were here, but not because I'm miserable without you. I've rarely been happier. I want to share that happiness with you. I also longed for you ten years ago, after I left the garage, but then my longing didn't come from a desire to share happiness with you. I wanted you to help me out of my misery. When Hugh asked me not to join him in his activity at the project house, my heart broke. How similar that activity must have been to the activities I shared with you in the carton plant. How similar that project house must have been to the council office I'm in right now. 
How I long to work with you, to be loved by him, to be accepted by the street people. The most exploited, the most dehumanized started to stand up, refusing to accept the life into which they were born. They started becoming themselves on their own, as Hugh put it. And today, many of those very people are occupying factories. I wanted to be part of that movement, part of that community. But in Hugh's eyes, I could only be a leech on that community. I could only push it back down, suck its strength out of it and incapacitate it at the very moment when it was trying to raise itself up on its own. I could only be part of the cancer that annihilates every possibility of life and puts an end to every period of ferment. Those are your words, not Hugh's. I copy them into my address book. They were so similar to his. I may be profoundly deluded about who I am, but I really don't think I deserve your or Hugh's descriptions of me. I had already started working in the fiberglass factory when I found Hugh. At the very moment when he called me a leech, I was already discovering what it meant to be exploited, maltreated, injured. I was already one of the units of human flesh on which the Leviathan feeds. I was already exchanging my life for a lifeless survival. You told me you felt a certain satisfaction, I think you called it resignation, during the hours you spent in that steel factory and during the hours you spent traveling there. I came closer to feeling defeated. I don't remember everything you said about your resignation, and I'm not sure I can really pinpoint the difference between that and defeat. I think by resignation you meant to say that you didn't really accept your condition, but that you put up with it because you didn't see any prospects for abolishing it. As soon as such prospects appeared, you'd be among those fighting to abolish the condition. Many people must feel that way. The proof is that today they're destroying the jobs to which they were resigned only yesterday. But I didn't feel that way. My attitude was infinitely more cowardly, even slavish. I was resigned, yes, and I dreamed of getting out of that factory, exactly as I'd gone in, by myself. The liberation I dreamed of was my liberation from that factory, not our liberation from that condition. I wasn't resigned but defeated. For me there were no prospects other than for me to leave, letting all the other me's remain there. Was I spoiled, as you suggested? Was I unwilling to share the conditions of my peers because I aim for a social position like Vera's? I really don't think so. Yet I can't really justify having left that factory the way I did. I can tell myself such factories wouldn't exist if everyone left them, but I know perfectly well that not all the people in that factory had college educations on which to fall back or rich sisters who'd come to their rescue. I think the truth is that I didn't have the physical or moral strength to feel resigned. I was dying on that job, literally dying. I wouldn't have survived until the day when the prospects appeared. My resignation wouldn't have been an acceptance of a temporary setback, but an acceptance of certain death. I was defeated in the face of a condition I really couldn't cope with. My only prospect was to escape from it. That was the only factory job I ever had. I'm sure all factory work isn't as horrible as mine, but I would have never had the slightest desire to find out. The mere thought of doing anything even slightly similar to what I did there sends shivers down my spine. I was one of four people, three women and a man, who pulled a continuous blanket of fiberglass from one set of rollers and pushed it into another set. Although we wore long rubber gloves, boots, and masks, minute particles of glass found their way into every pore of our skin, into our hair, our mouths, our nostrils, our lungs. It had a peculiar, horribly offensive smell. I still get nauseated whenever anything reminds me of it. I felt perpetually as if pins were sticking me. The smell followed me wherever I went. I lost my appetite because everything tasted like glass. That job didn't only consume my time, my energy, my human possibilities, like the bus you described so vividly. It literally consumed my very life. One of the women I work with described our situation with the most bizarre sense of humor. It's not really so bad once you figure out what it's all about, she'd say. At first you hate it so bad you can't wait to get out of it. Then your lungs go. They can fix you up the first time if you've got one strong lung. When you come back, you know the wait won't be so long. One lung can't take as much as two. That's when it becomes fun. You want to see how long you can hold out. They always fire you the second time you go to the hospital. They know you've made it. You're out of it. There's no more waiting. She went to the hospital for the second time a few weeks before I left that job. In order to prepare oneself for a day when there are new prospects on the horizon, you have to assume you'll survive until that day. I couldn't assume that. My only prospects were escape or death. Your worst three years in prison couldn't have been as empty or as painful as the three years I spent in that fiberglass factory. During both prison terms, you seem to have found frequent occasions to have profound discussions with people, occasions to think meaningfully about yourself, your past, your surroundings, your future. For me, those three years were like a coma from which I awoke three or four times. 
and I remained drowsy even during those few moments of wakefulness. What a horror! I know all about hardships and circumstances, but I still don't understand how people can put up with that. Out of over a thousand days, I was awake and alive during three days, if that long. On my last day in the garage, Minnie had blamed Sabina and Jose for the fact that I had become a mindless idiot, a grinning vegetable. How wrong she was. It wasn't the garage, but the entire society outside it that transformed human beings into grinning vegetables. I was awake for at most three days during those three years, and almost all the waking hours took place during the last year. I remember only one event during the first two years, and that only took a few minutes. I didn't dream of telephoning Sabina or Jose. I knew Jose would never forgive me for having run out on him exactly as I'd run out on Ron. I didn't blame him. And I couldn't bear the thought of Sabina saying, Coward, you're just like your mother. I did telephone Louisa once, several months after I'd left her. I no longer know why I called her. I suppose I wasn't really awake even then. I lied to her. I'm calling to let you know I'm alive and happy, I told her. So am I, she said, intensely alive and very happy. Do you want to get together to celebrate our happiness or just to talk? I'd rather not, Louisa. I hope that doesn't hurt your feelings. Not at all, she said. In fact, I'm relieved. I'd rather not face you after that last scene you made. That makes two of us. Both of us were silent for a while. Then I said, goodbye, Louisa, and hung up. I didn't see or talk to Louisa again for seven years. I ran into her by accident last year after the riot in a bizarre committee which was supposed to document or publicize the police repression during the riot. The only prospect I had during those first two years was to save enough money to escape from that hell. Unlike most of the other people in that factory, I didn't have a family to support or a home to furnish and decorate. I didn't buy any of the things they bought. I remained in that cheap hotel room and saved three quarters of my paycheck. I calculated that after five years I'd have enough money saved to support myself for another five years without working. I intended to spend the later period writing about the early period. I'd be free if I were still alive. But my prospects suddenly changed. One evening I returned from work and saw two familiar figures sitting on the doorstep of my hotel. I immediately recognized Sabina, but Tina had grown so much during those two years. I walked faster and then ran directly into Sabina's waiting arms. I was so relieved when she embraced and kissed me. I turned to Tina, shook her hand, and exclaimed, You're as tall as I am, Tina. I almost didn't recognize you. What are you two doing here? Tina had tears in her eyes when she said, We were thrown out this morning, Sophia, so we came to you. I couldn't hold back my tears. To me? You came to me? You mean you both forgive me? Sabina answered sarcastically, Who said anything about forgiving you? How sentimental. We've come for revenge. How can we ever forgive you after all you've done to us? I dropped Tina's hand and backed away from both of them, frightened. What do you mean? Revenge? Tina jumped toward me and pulling me to her whispered, You are unbelievably dumb, Sophia. That's why I missed you so much after you left. Don't you know how much Sabina likes you? We know you couldn't help what you did. But Sabina exclaimed, Don't let yourself be blackmailed by her tears, Tina. We've come for revenge, Sophia, and we won't let your sentimental tears divert us from the purpose of our visit. Our first step will be to force a decent meal down your throat. Tina, still holding me in her strong, skinny arms, whispered, Small wonder you thought I was so tall. The hotel keeper told us you took bread and cheese to your room and never went out. Unashamed, I let my tears run freely down my face. I love you, both of you. You may regret that admission after we're through with you, Sabina said sarcastically, while each of them put her hand under one of my arms and started pulling me toward a restaurant. After we fatten you, we're going to abandon you to your new friends. I don't have any friends, I sobbed. I saw one in your room, Tina exclaimed. The hotel man let us in. He wanted your sister and your daughter to wait for you in your room, but I was scared to death. It was so big and ugly. I suppose there aren't any rats where you come from, princess, I said to Tina, angered and dismayed by her distinctly upper-class attitude toward my proletarian room. No, there aren't, Tina exclaimed. You know there aren't. I've never seen a rat before. When we arrived here this morning, we intended to rent a room near yours. But I begged Sabina not to. I wouldn't have slept a wink. We spent the whole day looking for a place, and we found one, right near here, and cheap. I forgot my pride in my living quarters and started sobbing again. Is there room for me? Sabina hugged me, so this time I knew she was joking when she said, Not even a corner, Sophia. I told you we intended to fatten you only in order to feed you to your new friends. I won't take up much room, I cried. You sure won't, Tina exclaimed as we entered the restaurant. Watch the waiter show us t to a table for two. Wow, Sophia, you sure don't know how to take care of yourself. When one of Sabina's friends told her you'd left your mother and gotten a job, we thought you'd be all right. We never imagined you'd be starving yourself and sharing a room with rats. 
When we left your room to look for another place, Sabina said, looks like we got here just in time. Of course we found a place with room for you, dummy. We rented a whole house. Sabina and I didn't even choose our rooms yet. She said she wanted you to have you the first choice, if you'd come with us. I couldn't see the words on the menu in front of me. Sabina kicked me under the table. If you don't stop acting like a broken faucet, I'm going to imitate your act, Sophia. Why don't you just smile and eat and skip the melodrama? I tried hard to smile and I tried hard to eat, but I couldn't do either very well. The food was delicious, but it went down my throat with particles of glass. Sabina and Tina waited for me outside my hotel while I stuffed all my belongings into two grocery bags. I loved the house they had rented. The three of us had lived in it for eight years when Tina left two weeks ago. The night we arrived, there was nothing in it but three cots, Sabina's and Tina's bundles, and a suitcase containing the few books, the two manuscripts, and the old clothes I'd left in the garage. When I returned from work the following evening, there was a refrigerator, a stove, as well as a table and chairs in the kitchen. There were beds and cabinets in all the rooms. There was a rug and a sofa in the living room. On the kitchen table were platters containing all the foods I had loved when Sabina and I had been small, before I ever met you. I couldn't stop myself from crying again. Sabina, I've never done anything for you. It never even crossed my mind, not once. And I never ever will again, since I'm making you so miserable. I'm sorry, don't people sometimes cry when they're happy? All this must have cost you a fortune. The food, the furniture, the rugs. They were all gifts, Sabina said. I saved a lot of money during the past two years. I'm not penniless anymore. I can pay for the food and furniture. I think I should at least pay the rent. And be our landlady, Sabina asked angrily. Not on your life. Each of us pays one third of the rent. But you've spent so much already. All this food and Sabina turned to Tina and asked, how much have we spent? Tina then turned to me and asked, Sophia, do you mean you actually go to the supermarket to buy groceries? But surely you didn't stuff the refrigerator and beds into your coats. Tina said, we were thrown out of the garage, but Sabina didn't lose all her friends. I couldn't believe it. Everything matches so well. It's all so tasteful. How could it all have been stolen and in a single day? One of her friends works as a truck dispatcher. She had the contents of an enormous mansion delivered here. The neighbors must think we're millionaires. Three moving vans came. We only took the things we wanted. They probably weren't even missed. I ate the meal they had prepared for me, but I enjoyed their thoughtfulness more than I enjoyed the meal. Even my favorite foods tasted like glass. Sabina, as if she sensed my feelings, told me halfway through the meal, it's clear to you, isn't it, Sophia, that you don't have to go back to that job? I couldn't think clearly. I said thoughtlessly, thank you, Sabina, but there's one thing I won't accept from you, and that's your money. I don't know where it comes from, and I don't want to be dependent on it. None of what I said was true, and I knew it when I said it. Sabina turned her face away angrily, but only for a second. Then she was friendly again. She acted as if she hadn't heard. I obviously knew where her money came from, every penny of it. She had told me. She hadn't hidden anything from me. Snatches of what Alec had told me in the garage, snatches of what Hugh had said flew through my mind. But Hugh's and Alec's critique weren't the real reason for my refusal. During the previous two years, I had acquired another reason, an unbelievably crude one for not wanting to be dependent on Sabina or on anyone at all. I'm ashamed to tell you what it was. I had gotten into the habit of counting my money. Every week, I calculated the money I had earned, the amount I'd need for rent and food, and the amount I'd deposit in my bank account. I told you before that I intended to use this money later to live more comfortably and to write. That's not completely true. The life I'd live and the works I'd write were contained in my bank account. Whoever it was who said capitalists and workers had nothing in common had never worked for wages. Accumulate, accumulate. That's Moses and the prophets, not only in the bureaus of capitalists, but in the mind of every worker. I longed to leave the fiberglass factory, but I couldn't abandon my bank account. Two years of my past, as well as my whole future, were in it. If I had accepted Sabina's offer, every miserable minute of those two years would have been for nothing. By turning down Sabina's offer, I didn't use up two years of my life for nothing, but three. Sabina didn't insist, although she knew perfectly well what the job was doing to me. As always, I was my own person. She merely wanted me to be aware of all my alternatives. I abandoned that awkward topic and asked why she and Tina had been thrown out of the garage. Tina shocked me by answering, first of all, Jose was arrested. Jose, I exclaimed, why? Someone squealed, she said. Was there a raid? Was it the police that chased you out? We were chased out the same way your friends were, by Seth's gun. But that's awful. You've both been so cool. Why didn't you tell me? Sabina asked, would you have eaten more if you had known? Would you have slept better? She was right. I didn't care why they'd been thrown out. 
All I cared about was that they'd come to me, that they'd taken me away from that horrid hotel, that they loved me. You know I wouldn't have eaten more, I admitted. If I ever want to know the details, I'll ask. I never asked. But Sabina wanted me to know one more thing. A few days later, she told me, I visited Jose this afternoon. He wasn't glad to see me. Poor Ron, he said. He could never really appreciate you, Sabina. You're made of gold, you know that? But you were expecting someone else, weren't you? I asked him. Someone who wasn't made of metal, but of flesh. He turned away from me and cried. How could he? I sobbed. He has every reason in the world to hate me. I walked out on him exactly as I walked out on Ron. What about the rest of us? Tina asked, offended. You walked out on us, too. Don't we count? I started to cry, but Tina made me stop by squeezing my face in her hands and scolding me. You dumbbell, you're just like a baby. Whatever made me think you were my mother? You also walked out on Sabina and me. Yet here we are. Jose doesn't hate you, Sophia. He told me Ron never hated you. He told me Ron knew you couldn't ever do the things Ron wanted you to do. No one can hate you because of that. Besides, Jose told me he thought you were right, both times. I couldn't make myself ask more questions. But the following night, I did ask Sabina how to go to the state prison and what I needed to get in. She had papers made for me proving I was Jose's sister. Sabina had already visited him as his wife. The trip to the prison lasted over an hour each way. The visit was only half an hour long. The first time I went, Jose just kept rubbing his eyes. I can't believe it. Either you're Sabina turning yourself into Sophie by some magic trick, or else I'm in my cell dreaming. I'm me. But you look so different. What the hell happened to you, Sophie? Did you go through a machine? Aren't you going to ask me why I left you? You're a genius kid, that's why. You figured things out before any of the rest of us did. And that's why you ought to take better care of yourself. If you don't, you won't be around for that trip we were going to take. How did he size things up so fast? What was his name, your friend? Hugh. He sure pinned us down, right where it hurt. What made him able to see right through us? Was it something he learned in school? Is it in books? I'd sure like to see him again. Can you bring him with you sometime? No. I was crying. Words gagged in my throat. I couldn't see Jose when a guard accompanied him out of the visiting room. For two months, I did nothing but go to work and sleep. I should say almost nothing. A few days after my visit, I left a sheet of paper on the living room desk. On top, it said, For Jose. On it, I scribbled the titles of all the books I had read and discussed with people on the university newspaper staff. I kept adding titles as they came back to me. Whenever I added a title to the list, the book would appear in the living room bookshelf the following day, or else I'd see Tina reading it when I came home from work. She must have read all of them. I kept expecting Sabina to take some of them along on her visits to Jose, but she always went empty-handed. I had always been an avid reader from long before you knew me. Even during my stay in the garage, I had read at least three books a week, but I didn't open a single book during the three years I worked in the fiberglass factory. After my visit to Jose, my interest in the books I had read before revived. I wanted Jose to read them. It was the only way I knew to tell him what had made Hugh able to see right through us. That obviously wasn't an adequate response to Jose's question, but I couldn't deal with his question. The closest I could come to was deal with the books I'd read, the books Hugh had read. Two months after my first visit, I went to the prison with a bag full of books. They didn't let me in with all of them, but they didn't let enough through to take up all Jose's reading time between my visits. I went once a month. I came to life during those visits. Jose devoured the books. He couldn't wait to discuss them with me. He was no longer the Jose I'd known. He wasn't anyone I'd ever known. Our relationship wasn't a continuation of any relationship that had existed before. Our love had never existed. During those visits, I came to life as something you unflatteringly called me in your letters, as a pedagogue. I came to life as Jose's teacher, as his guide, as his mentor. What came to life, Yaristan, was my relationship to you. What revived was the week I'd spent with you, the tours you had given me, the discussions, the long, patient explanations. Only with Jose, it was I who did the guiding and the explaining. You've admitted that you yourself were a pedagogue after your release from your first prison term, when you first met Myrna. You taught her everything you'd learned from the resistance, from Luisa, from the prisoners you'd met. I came closest to my relationship with you by becoming to Jose what you had been to me and to Myrna. Isn't it ironic that this happened with Jose of all people? The Jose who devoured my books and waited impatiently to discuss them with me wasn't the person to whom I had abandoned myself in the garage. He became the person I had dreamed of meeting ever since I left you. He became the companion with whom I was going to experience a new world, the comrade with whom I was going to realize all my life's projects. I dreamed again of the day when Jose would be released, 
of the day when I would no longer have my job, but I didn't realize my dreams. Jose was released, and a few days later he was dead. The dreams I dreamed then are coming to life only now, in numerous factories, in this occupied university, in the council office where I'm writing this letter. And now that the activity is real, I'm no longer a pedagogue. You were right, and Hugh was right. I don't have anything to teach. I never did. I've learned more during the past week than I'd learned during the previous 20 years. Yes, I'm now the one who is learning all the things I thought I could teach. I learned quite a lot during the past three weeks. I wanted to tell you about some of them in my previous letter, but I had too much to tell. I was too carried away by the sequence of experiences that came back to my memory. Many of the things I didn't tell you answer questions you've been asking ever since you started writing me. I'm really sorry I didn't take a little more time to tell you all the things I learned from Sabina. I'm already starting to forget some of them, and the exciting events taking place around me aren't helping me keep everything straight. I started to tell you about the discussion Sabina and I had three weeks ago during our outing, but I didn't ever return to it. It was a beautiful day. It looks beautiful out right now, but I've hardly been outdoors for a week. We were all alone by the river, listening to quacking ducks, watching passing boats, talking about your letters and the questions you had raised. Sabina was unusually talkative. Your questions stimulated her to travel further and further back in time, all the way to the time of her birth, 32 years ago. Sabina often intimidates me, but despite that, I think she's really fantastic and I wish I had some of her qualities. That day, as we lay on the grass sunning ourselves, she told me stories George Alberts had told her over 20 years ago. I'm having a hard time remembering them only three weeks after I heard them. It's funny that Yaristan keeps referring to the time and place of my birth, she said. He wasn't even there. It's as if his memory were an extension of Luisa's. What's so funny about it, I asked. You weren't exactly there either. Your memory is an extension of Albert's. I was every bit of two when you were born, but I wasn't really there either. My memory doesn't have any extensions. I can hardly remember the few things I learned from Luisa. You know what, she asked. I wouldn't be surprised if that Manuel character Yaristan met in prison actually knew my grandfather, namely Nachalo, my father. Everything he told Yaristan has such a familiar ring to it. Manuel must at least have heard of him. Too many of the incidents are identical to the incidents Alberts described to me, only the interpretation is different, and by now my interpretation is closer to Manuel's than to Alberts. Sabina pointed to the passage where you said, I'm paraphrasing, I don't have your letter with me. According to Sabina, workers fought in a revolution in order to give power to people like Alberts, and people like Jan, Manuel, and I had to be swept out of the way. Sabina's response to this was, Alberts told me exactly the opposite, yet they both referred to the same events. In his own eyes, Alberts was the one who fought for a popular revolution, and he was the one who was pushed aside by those opposed to the revolution. They can't both be right. Yet I think neither Alberts nor Manuel were lying, although I do think Luisa lied most of the time. I think Alberts and Manuel both fought for something on opposite sides of the same battleground. They both described that battleground, though each of them saw something completely different. I know what Alberts fought for, but I still don't fully understand Manuel. Try to get Yaristan to tell you still more about him. I told her I tried, but I'm trying only now. Sabina told me about those events as if she'd experienced them herself, and as if they had taken place only yesterday. When she was small, Alberts never tired of telling her that she was born right after the greatest revolution that ever took place during one of the darkest nights in all history. The army attacked the city. Everyone was in the street. Nachalo, Luisa, and Margarita were behind barricades. Albert stayed indoors, minding two-year-old you. He told me how he pleaded with Margarita not to go out. She was about to give birth, but Margarita couldn't be kept indoors, and according to him, she was the revolution. A bullet grazed Margarita's arm. The injury wasn't serious, but she lost a lot of blood when she could least afford to. He always called her the little gypsy. She died two days after the revolution's victory, giving birth to me. She was 14. During those two days, Alberts never left Margarita's bedside. He told her the reactionary forces of the whole world had been destroyed by all the Margaritas behind the barricades. He told her she was giving birth to a new epoch. All the marvels of science and technology were going to make the people free instead of enslaving them. Gone was the day when workers had to fight against inventions and labor-saving devices which up to then had only been used to increase misery. Gone was the day when workers cursed science because it was used mainly to torture and kill them. He told her she was giving birth to an age of unfettered creativity, an epoch of unprecedented scientific and technological innovation carried out by the people themselves and for themselves. Margarita died giving birth to another little gypsy. That was the dark night. She wasn't ever going to enjoy her creation, 
neither she nor any of the other margaritas who gave birth to it. Alberts told me I was all that remained of the revolution he had told her about. I couldn't take my eyes off Sabina as I listened. It dawned on me that her whole life has been an attempt to realize Albert's hopes in herself, that she has tried to embody in her own being the revolution to which Margarita gave birth. Tell Yaristan his friend Manuel was right. The brightest of all days was followed by the darkest of all nights. The incredible victory on the streets and in the factories was immediately followed by an incredible defeat on the same streets and in the same factories. Luisa thought the defeat took place on the front, in the battlefield. She was wrong. The defeat took place in the rear. Alberts knew that by the time he told me I was all that was left of the victory, but he never figured out what role he played in that defeat. After Margarita's death, Natula left for the front. Luisa drove a streetcar and nursed both babies. Alberts was transformed. He wanted revenge. He ranted about destroying the reactionary forces that had taken Margarita's life and were destroying the world she had fought to create. He joined a military brigade consisting mainly of foreigners. He was told the aim of the brigade was to join with the revolutionary population to destroy the reactionary forces. And he believed that. He thought that after the liquidation of the few remaining nests of reactionaries, the field would be clear for the realization of his dream, Margarita's dream. He never admitted that this was a pack of lies. That popular army he enlisted in had only one aim, to impose itself over the population. In its view, the main nest to be liquidated was the revolutionary population itself. The campaigns against the reactionary army were nothing but a pretext, a justification for its existence. It was the popular army he joined that wiped out every trace of Margarita's victory, every possibility for the realization of her dream. He never admitted that. He blamed the population itself for the defeat. His view of the population always remained identical to that army's view, hoodlums, adventurers, and saboteurs. According to him, all the revolutionaries had been killed on the barricades or died after that battle. There were no margaritas left. But that wasn't what he thought when he joined the popular army. He thought he was joining a revolutionary population in a struggle against reactionaries. He thought that army actually had the population support. When it finally dawned on him that it didn't, he ran. He was always a Democrat, first of all. Once he convinced himself that the entire population was reactionary and not just a few nests, he ran. He never figured out that it was the popular army itself that was the central nest of reaction, but he did have enough principles to refuse to fight in an army that opposed the entire population. I asked Sabina when she figured all this out. When I met Ron, she told me, actually when Ron moved in with me in Albert's house. Albert's called him a hoodlum, an adventurist, a petty criminal. That was when I started to figure out who that army had fought against, whom Albert's blamed for that defeat. The reason I liked Ron was that I thought Margarita must have been a little like him. The same mixture of fury and humor, the same visceral rejection of all morality. Both were accomplished pranksters, unselfconscious thieves, and fatally romantic, except that poor Ron never found his barricades. Albert's was the diametrical opposite of both. He stayed indoors during the day of the barricades. He didn't move off his ass to join the fight until all the adventure and romance were gone, until an apparatus had replaced the fighting people. Inside that apparatus, Alberts experienced only one campaign, and it wasn't at all heroic. His brigade unit reached the front in a village which was terrorized by a small, poorly armed enemy unit. A villager was frequently killed if he wandered off alone. Occasional showers of shells caused numerous injuries. Before the arrival of Alberts' brigade unit, the village had supposedly been defended by a loosely disciplined militia unit. According to Alberts, this militia unit didn't protect the village from the enemy, but was in fact an extension of the enemy beyond the front and was itself responsible for the terror reigning in the village. The sole activity of that militia was to sabotage weapons, shoot at their own troops, encourage desertion among the soldiers, demoralize the village population. Some weeks before Albert's arrival, a military commander had arrived in the village to coordinate the militia's moves with those of the rest of the popular army, and the commander had been murdered. The first task of Albert's brigade unit was to liquidate the enemy agents who had infiltrated and taken over the militia unit. The infiltrators were known, there were eight of them, but the villagers were so demoralized and the militia unit was so rotten that the infiltrators carried on their activities in broad daylight. Part of the militia even tried to prevent Albert's popular army unit from arresting the infiltrators. Albert's accepted an assignment to the firing squad which was to liquidate the infiltrators. He still wanted to revenge Margarita and to remove one of the nests that prevented the realization of all she'd fought for. But just before the order to shoot was given, one of the eight condemned men shouted, Next time the people rise, they'll turn against the red butchers first. That will be the first moment of the real revolution. 
When the order to shoot was given, Albert shot into the air. This was his only military campaign, Sabina told me, and at the critical moment he refused to take part in it. The condemned man had spoken in the name of the people. The firing squad was killing him in the name of the people. Alberts had joined the brigade to liquidate a few nests of reactionaries, not to liquidate the people. When he heard that man, Albert suddenly suspected that the people might not want the revolution his popular army was bringing them, and his suspicions were confirmed in a matter of hours. The entire militia unit and half the villagers surrounded his brigade unit. Shooting began. His popular army unit had to abandon the village altogether and camp outside it, fortifying itself against the enemy unit as well as the surrounding peasantry. It became clear to him that the task of his brigade was to force Marguerite's revolution down people's throats with weapons. That wasn't the project he had in mind, and it couldn't be done in any case. When that poorly armed enemy unit attacked, it had the whole population support. Alberts was injured, half his comrades were killed, his popular army unit was routed. That was when he concluded that the entire population was reactionary, hoodlums, adventurers, and saboteurs. They were never industrialized by themselves. Margarita's dream was an illusion. Alberts ran. He's been running ever since. Thinking I'd missed one of the main points of Sabina's story, I said, then Alberts didn't actually agree with the aims of that army he joined, and Yaristan is wrong when he accuses Alberts of wanting to impose his own power over that population. Yaristan means something different, something I don't altogether understand, she said. Yaristan thinks Albert's project, his very dream, was repressive in and of itself. She showed me the passage where you said industrialization could only take place by robbing human beings of their energy, by stunting their capacities. Albert's finally concluded that industrialization could never be carried out by the people themselves, she continued. The implication being that the people would always need someone like Albert's at the helm, as foreman, supervisor, boss. By adopting that attitude, Albert's became an outright reactionary, a turncoat. That became perfectly clear to me when he had Debbie Matthews fired for her supposedly radical views. It was then that he and I parted ways. He crawled up the bureaucracy and I rejoined Margarita on the ground. We went a long way to proving him wrong, all of us, Ron, Tissy, Jose, Ted, the people themselves. We industrialized on our own. Yaristan knows that people can do that on their own, but he goes a step further. He says it's not worth doing. His opposition to Alberts is different from mine. In his view, Alberts didn't only want to push people aside to make room for the supposedly indispensable bosses. That far we agree. Yaristan also thinks that if people freely develop their potentialities, there's no steel. If there's steel, then there are no potentialities and no people. I don't understand that. Maybe I'm too much George Albert's daughter to understand that. Maybe I'm too much the little gypsy who fought on the barricades so as to conquer the science and the technology for myself and others like me. What Albert's taught me was that the power of the people as well as their freedom resided in the steel, in the technology, in physics, chemistry, and engineering, in machinery. That's been the axiom of my life and it remained my axiom after Albert's turned against the people. He never turned against the technology. I thought those who opposed the technology were outright medieval obscurantists. I reminded her that Louisa had in fact called you a reactionary after she'd read one of your letters. I know, I heard her, she's wrong. When you call someone a name, you stop listening to him. Louisa hasn't heard anything for thirty years. Yarstan is no reactionary. He's trying to tell me something that conflicts with my most basic axioms. I think he's wrong, but I'm not sure. I'd like to be sure before I call him any names. It was almost night when Sabina and I left our desolate spot by the river's edge and returned to the city. I was baffled by much of what she told me. I couldn't sort it out into clear and distinct categories. But I was happy as I crossed the bridge with Sabina. I was happy because I knew you and was together with you again, at least by mail. I was happy, and even somewhat proud, to cross the bridge with my little gypsy sister. Happy that I too had been born somewhere near the uproar she described. And I was happy because I thought I understood both you and Sabina a little better. But my self-satisfied mood didn't last long. My happiness as well as the details of Sabina's story were replaced by my worries about the note from the college administration. My arrest, my firing, and Tina's departure were all I could think of last time I wrote you. It took me several days to get used to the fact that I was unemployed again and that Damon wasn't going to help me get another job. The only time I ever looked for a job of my own, I landed in that horrid fiberglass factory. But I was in no mood to sit home worrying about that. Sabina's narrative stimulated my interest in other questions you had asked. On the day after I mailed my letter to you, on Sunday two weeks ago, I telephoned Louisa. I remembered she had once known Le Micelle and in fact seen him much more recently than I had. I learned this a year ago when I ran into her by chance after the riot. 
At that time, I'd asked her what she'd been doing besides working during the seven years since I'd last seen her. She told me that for several years she'd gotten deeply involved in the activities of the so-called peace movement, and that she'd been introduced to that movement by none other than a former friend of yours, Sophia, a young man by the name of Lem. I turned away in disgust. The last time I'd seen Lem, I had lost all desire to see him or hear of him again. But your letters have revived my interest in Lem. You asked me several times why Lem had been arrested 12 years ago while trying to deliver my letter to you, and I wasn't able to answer. I decided to find out once and for all by trying to find Lem and by getting his own account of his arrest. 